pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement in Texarkana. It's a rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like each of Joe's Airbnb hosts like to call me, the Fintern. Happy Monday, stackers. Who would have thought that after all this time, we'd be right back here where we started? Remember all those nice things I said about missing the real basement? Yeah, I can without a doubt confirm now that uh, that was just nostalgia speaking. But don't let anyone say the Fintern ever let a few smells or spills get in the way of a job well done. I stay calm, cool, and collected no matter what's thrown at me. I know, I know. You're sitting there wondering, how can you be more like me? (laughs) Well, no worries. Your wait is over. Because today, I'm queuing up one of our favorite special episodes, a Joe and OG Top 5. We used to have more of these special episodes than we do today, so this is a real throwback. Today's lesson? The Top 5 Cool, Calm, and Collected Ways That You Should React to Market Volatility. Plus, the guys talk about signs it's time for a new advisor, and answer a question about stretching IRA rules. This is a rewind show from 2016, so disregard any investment advice or giveaways. Enjoy, Fintern out. In a world where overspending, debt, and keeping up with the Joneses rules us all, where the voices from the merchants, restaurants, and credit companies lord over the common man, Out of the darkness, like a beacon of hope, comes a new voice. A voice that's rich and creamy, like your favorite butter, and delicious, like cheeseburger pizza on your diet cheat day. It's The Stacking Benjamin Show. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. today's thrilling monday podcast we're bringing you our top five ways to deal with portfolio risks also are we headed into a bear market and how do you stretch an ira i've got my top five reasons this podcast is going nowhere and here are my top two joe and oh g hey everybody welcome back Glad to have you along for the ride. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And with me across the card table today is a dude with a runny nose, the one and only OG. Got a little snivel going on today. Dude, that's what happens when you go on too many vacations. It's like that commercial I was thinking about this morning where the guy's laying on the couch and his wife's about ready to walk out to work. He says, you know, honey, when I was a kid and I was sick, my mom would make me like chicken noodle soup. And his wife looks at him and throws him the phone and goes, huh, well, call your mom. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt this morning. I was like, you know, sweetie, when I was sick when I was a kid, my mom used to. Oh, I know Mrs. OG. She'd do the same thing. Yeah. She goes, huh, interesting. All right. See you later. Call your mom then. Bye. Well, that's great. And what's funny is you've been calling for mom. I wonder why you were calling for mom. 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 Yeah. Mom. She doesn't care either. She's more of a tyrant. By the way, on that note, you were talking about your personal trainer. Guess what I did today? I went to a personal trainer for the first time. Cool. How'd they go? That's why my arms haven't left the card table since you and I sat down. Yeah. Did you puke? <laughs> no, I did not. No. Did you want to? I did not. No. Did you eat breakfast beforehand? I did not. Jeez, you're a better man than I. Hey, we got a great show today. People love our top fives. And today I heard that there was this thing called volatility in the market lately, OG. Not sure what that's all about, but I don't know. Apparently uh, market's been moving a little, huh? I wouldn't know. I've been on vacation. We have no clue, but we thought we'd talk about volatility and how to cope with volatility. That's going to be our top five today. But first, we got some headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. This article comes to us from Fortune magazine. Everybody has an opinion, OG. Everybody has an opinion. This one comes to us from... That's what they say about people. Elbows and opinions. Everybody's got them. Everybody's got them. This one's about this current stock market that we know nothing about. Wall Street's awful start this year could be short-lived from Reuters. I bring up this article because this is the counterpunch to what we're seeing over and over, right? Royal Bank of Scotland says, take all your money out. JP Morgan says, hey, the end is coming. And Reuters says, in all bold, blame the herd, period. 
That's the first paragraph. Three words, blame the herd. With financial markets having their worst start to the year in history, investors are following the advice of bears such as Royal Bank of Scotland. And yet little has fundamentally changed of late beyond sentiment. Fears about China's financial and economic health have prompted investors to dump stocks equal in value to the annual economic output of Britain and France combined since New Year's. And then it goes on to say that lots of companies are saying, you know what, it's going to be horrible. And yet when you look at the data, OG, nothing's changed. This is why I like that JP Morgan guide to the markets. It's funny that they would say, well, I guess it's not funny. They're all about just generating trading revenue, right? Sure, so right. They want you to sell and then they'll turn around and buy. But they've got this great product on their websites for free. You can get it. It's called Guide to the Markets. And I've talked about it a hundred times. Basically, it's just a collection of data. It talks about equity markets, talks about asset allocation, fixed income markets, unemployment. It's got all sorts of economic data. And it doesn't actually give you any opinions on it. It just gives you the data and you can read into it how you want. And I suppose you could read into anything to the negative, right? It's just like I think I saw in the Wall Street Journal the other day that China's GDP growth for last year was 7%. But apparently that's bad because it's not 10%. That's funny because in this article about five paragraphs down, it says that China's economy is no longer growing at breakneck speed. 7% sounds like breakneck speed to me. Yeah. I mean, we would be happy with a 4% growth here in the States. So I guess it's all how you read into it. But I'm with this article on this at this time. I think that very little has fundamentally changed. Reuters also says this, according to the efficient market hypothesis, stocks incorporate and reflect all relevant information available to the market, meaning they're always fairly and accurately priced. But as countless examples down the years have shown, markets are vulnerable to herd mentality among investors, resulting in huge price swings and volatility. Once a market gains momentum and overshoots in either direction, it's often difficult to stop. Let's talk about those two things for our 101 listeners out there, OG, because these are pretty important. Efficient market hypothesis. Explain that. Well, simply put, it just means that all of the information that could possibly be known about a company is already known and is already priced into the price of the stock. Yeah, basically. So you, don't, you don't have an edge, basically. That's what I was going to say. If you think you have an idea, I think part of that is if you have an idea, you assume somebody else had that idea before you did. Yes. Yeah. And you don't uncover anything new, really. I mean, if you look at... This is kind of an interesting experiment. Look at a stock that issues an announcement of some kind and has a big spike. How instantaneous that the price swing happens. It's not that it happens over time. It happens the nanosecond that that information becomes public. So if you think that you can trade on information before somebody else, or if you think that you've got some insider intel that nobody else does, uh, I don't know about that. And then let's talk about herd mentality, because I think herd mentality takes this efficient market hypothesis and says, okay, there's people trading on that information, right? But then this is too many people trading on that information, which creates some price inefficiencies. I would think that although it sounds like those things couldn't work at the same time, it seems like we've seen that over the years. Yeah. If I'm a young person right now, I got to be a little excited. I know that I believe it was JP Morgan Chase that said, don't buy the dips on this cycle. Instead, sell the upswings. Right. But I think if I'm 25 or 30 listening to this, I am seeing if I can double down on my retirement plan at work. There's only so many times throughout your lifetime that the market goes through a 10 or 15 or 20 percent decline. And while we can't predict the future, it seems like every time it's happened in the past, it's always gone on to reach newer, higher and better highs, right? So I would be advising to send as much money as possible into your retirement accounts I know. or any accounts for that matter. I know. And if you're 60... But I advise that all the time. So Well, that's true. But if you're 65 years old and you're worried about your money, your money's in the wrong place, right? Because your money should be in spots already if you're close to what we call in landing the plane where you're going to need to take dollars out. You probably have too much money in stock. That or you can think about it that you still have another 30 some odd years to go and a day or two of market volatility is not really the end of the world. Yeah. Despite what CNBC might suggest. Our second article comes to us from Investment News. This is by Liz Skinner. Liz writes a lot of great financial stuff. Uh, 10 signs your client's cheating on you. Of course, Investment News is written to financial advisors, OG. And I thought it'd be fun with your expertise and what you do every day in the trenches to talk about this. It says many clients use more than one financial advisor, but there are some telltale signs to suggest that a financial advisor may be losing the quest to stay or become the main financial professional in their life. 
some experts highlight some signs that clients aren't being faithful. Number 10, excuses, excuses. If clients are canceling meeting after meeting with you or making excuses for why they can't come in or even jump on a phone call, it's a big sign they're using another advisor. May even be planning to move more money out of your control. I think it says more than that, OG. I mean, I'm not worried about them working with another advisor. If a client doesn't want to come to my meeting, they clearly don't value my opinion and my relationship. And that was when I would tell them we got to part ways. Yep, I agree. Yeah, because why does somebody have an advisor in their corner if they're not going to take their phone call, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're not talking about the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on vacation this week. It's the repeated behavior. It was funny because sometimes early in my career, clients wouldn't take it that seriously. And I think it was because of me, because I was more salesy, because I really needed the business, right? I needed to eat. And so clients would no call, no show. And so I got into this practice of calling them up and going, hey, I hope everything's okay. I hope you weren't in a car wreck because I know you wouldn't cancel this meeting. I've got all this prep work for our meeting. I've got all these things that we need to talk about. And man, just call me and let me know you're okay. You know, the meeting's no big deal. Call me and let me know you're okay. And that would do one of two things. Either they would leave or they'd never just stand me up again. Right. Yep. I've done that. It's just horrible. Number nine, What's so good about you? If a client comes in with a lot of questions about how your strategy compares to others, it's a good bet they're using or at least considering using another financial professional or investment solution. I actually was okay with that. I had no problem with somebody coming in and saying, hey, I heard from my brother-in-law or I heard from this other guy about this thing because I think that's part of an advisor's job, right, is to explain how these things work. I never got offended if somebody said, hey, I was thinking, you know, ETFs sound like they might be for me and I know we don't have any. You know what I mean? An advisor's job is to educate, I think, just as much as it is to, you know, help you reach your long-term goals. So I welcome questions like that too. Yeah. Did you ever think that when somebody does that though, that their client's cheating on you, that they're talking to another advisor? No, I can think of one or two examples where somebody threw a buzzword at me or something and I went, ooh, that puckered me up for a second. I do remember you know, that that but, one story you told three or four years ago about the guy with the annuity. Well, that doesn't really narrow it down, but. <laughs> no, remember the guy that came in and he had talked to, you'd worked with him forever. And he, for some unbelievable reason, talked one time to a guy that wanted to sell him an annuity and then he bought the annuity. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. That has a profoundly odd ending to that story. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Yeah. Did the guy die? The guy died, didn't he? Uh-huh. Yeah. But that's not the ending of the story. Oh, that's not? Oh. Number eight, daydreamers, clients who sit through your presentations but seem preoccupied by other things. Perhaps their cell phone or signaling they aren't confident about your ability to serve their needs well. First of all. That could be like a class in college as well. I I don't know about that. I know. Well, that's what I was going to say. If you're an advisor making presentations, you know, I can't remember times where we weren't just having a discussion. Even if I went to the whiteboard, because I had a whiteboard in my office, I think you do too, right? I'd have a whiteboard in my office and I'd go up and I'd be teaching them something. It was still a discussion. If it ever was in presentation land, then I'm a sales guy. Right. Not that excited about that. I'll just link to this on the show notes. I thought that those were interesting. I guess there's one more in here, digging in on fees. Those who complain about the fees they're paying or ask for more detailed bills are raising a red flag that the assets you're watching over them are under attack. If somebody is, I don't mind people questioning fees, but I do think that if somebody is constantly hitting me up about how much they're paying, they're not seeing the value in what I'm doing for them. Yes, I agree 100% on that. I don't have any problem sending letters about how much things were and that sort of thing, especially around tax time. We get that a lot. You know, how much how much were the services last year? Because sometimes they're tax deductible. But if it's belly aching about it, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, yep. i uh, link to both of those in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. I think our lessons from these are twofold, OG. The first one is down market. <laughs> probably as much of an opportunity as it is a setback. And then number two is if you're in your meeting fidgeting with your phone, or if you're not taking the calls of your advisor, maybe it's either time for a different advisor or time to reconsider the relationship. No guest today, OG, no guest. You and I, we're taking this one because it's been a while since we've had a top five episode. These are always some of our favorite episodes. 
and also episodes that get requested as much as any other type of episode. So today we're going to talk about volatility because there's been some volatility in the market and I think it's perfect. People always wonder what to do, right? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had some calls, even with your opinion about volatility, OG, I'm sure you've had some calls and I'm sure in your meetings, you've had at least talk about the volatility in the market lately. We've definitely had questions about it for sure. I, of course, have a strong opinion that it doesn't matter. But nevertheless, that has to be tempered a little bit with kind of some uh, hand-holding. Absolutely. I had a list of my clients that panicked the most that I would have to call first when the market went down. And I know this is something that a lot of advisors didn't do. But I had some clients that I knew, no matter how much we talked through the strategy, no matter what we did, I was going to have to talk these people off the ledge every stinking time. And sure enough, I would have to talk them off the ledge every stinking time. And if I didn't call them, they were always my first ones to call me. So I made this list of people that, you know, we had to do things a little differently. So if you're somebody that has a hard time sleeping at night when the market goes down, it's not always about the market. It's about you, right? And I think that that behavioral piece is something that sometimes people forget. I think that's the biggest piece out of all of it, right? I mean, at the end of the day, stock market's going to do what it's going to do, regardless of your input or consideration. I mean, very few people have the ability to actually make a stock move based on their transactions. And those that can have the ability to do that generally don't do that because of that reason. Right. Right. So Warren Buffett. Yeah. If he decided he didn't want to coke anymore, all of a sudden, you know, there'd be ripples, but that screws him more than it screws the rest of the people. You know what I mean? Like he's a large shareholder. So In any event, you just have to understand, I think anyway, when it comes to volatility, you have to understand that you have absolutely no control over it, except for the control, what you think about it. You know, it's what's in your brain that's controlling what's really happening. And I'm not sure about your top five, but that's more about what my top five are geared toward. These are not the five right things to do. These are the five ways to make it more palatable for you as you have volatility if you're having trouble sleeping. So let's jump into these. Top five ways to deal with volatility. Number five. Who's going to go first here? You want to go first today? Yeah, yeah, I'll go first. All right. So the first one that I have is dollar cost average. I mean, if you've got a plan of systematically investing a fixed dollar amount for a period of time for your children's college or retirement or the case may be, sticking to that plan and not changing it is one way to kind of handle the volatility because at least subconsciously you can recognize that you're picking up more and more shares at a lower price. That doesn't always mean that you're going to make money in using dollar cost averaging. But in times with high fluctuation of the pricing of different things, that's one way to kind of handle it. If we're sticking to the theme of it's yeah. it's all between the ears, you know. I think dollar cost averaging, it helps you manage the fact that the market's going down. Just that thought OG that I'm still buying, that I'm buying as these prices go down, is kind of an exciting thing turns that pit in your stomach into something more fun. My number five, I actually don't like because I have four that are really good. The fifth one I see people do all the time. I've heard Susie Orman even talk about doing this one, and that is setting triggers in your head of when you're going to make portfolio decisions. So you say, okay, if my portfolio gets to X or if this position goes to X, then I'm going to execute. And what's funny is when it comes to behavioral finance, this doesn't work very well because I'll tell you what happens is if you set that X at 10%, and then you're going to make a decision to leave the market that time. You know what ends up happening? You say, I'm going to wait a little longer and I'm going to wait a little longer and I'm going to wait a little longer. And what ends up happening is you might as well just be a buy and hold investor. But a lot of people say that, hey, I'm going to set this spot in my head where if it goes down this far, then I'm going to move. The bad news about that, too, when you do that is twofold. Not only do you have to hope the market doesn't come back right away, right? (laughs) Bounce right up. But then if you do take your money out, you got to decide when to put it back in. And you're going to see that as a theme as we go along, because I've got a few more strategies that always have that problem. Any defense I think you play, OG, has that problem of having to be right twice. Yep. Number four. You want to do four this time? Yeah. Alternate? Yeah, deal. I'll go for it. Go. My fourth one is a technical one, and that's why it's number four on my list, which is using option strategies. Options can be incredibly difficult. A lot of people can't wrap their head around them, but especially in volatile markets with this herd mentality we were talking about earlier, in the option market, I think that's a time when you can take an option and instead of making a silly move, place an option on your portfolio so that you can say, even if the market goes down, 
if the market goes down, I can maintain this X value. It's going to cost me some money, right? The cost of the option is going to cost me some money. But if the pit of my stomach, I can't handle the volatility, I buy a little bit of insurance, which is what the option is. And I know that even if the market goes down, then I can buy back at the price that it was at before. So my number four is use options. Pretty complicated stuff there, Joe. All right. Number four for me is kind of goes with dollar cost averaging rebalance. So your dollar cost averaging, if the portfolio changes dramatically, I always rebalance once a year just because it's easier. But if all of a sudden something is so out of whack, right? If all of a sudden your international holdings are down 20%, that's a great opportunity to rebalance the portfolio, especially if the rest of the portfolio hasn't done the same thing. If just one area has really kind of taken it on the chin, so to speak, it's a great time to pull some money off of one area invested in the part that's gone down quite a bit. So this kind of goes with a little bit with your number five of setting targets, but this helps with your target allocation. So if you've got a target allocation of 20% in five different categories and you say, okay, if it ever gets to 25%, then I'm going to make a change. Or if it ever gets to 30%, then I'm going to make a change. And that change should be a rebalance, not a new thing, new buy or sell or something. Well, what I like about that versus my set targets, remember set targets, you're setting them in your brain and a rebalance, you're doing it. There's no yeah. decision making, right? That setting those targets in your head are just, okay, it reaches this, then I'm going to make a decision. There's none of that. My decisions are already made. Now it's just execute. How often do you tell people to rebalance? Usually I'd rebalance once a year. Okay. Yeah. Did you do that more if somebody's nervous Nelly, as mom says? No. Yeah. No, I mean, notwithstanding what I just said, if there's an obnoxious abnormality, Right. I mean, last year, for example, in the first quarter, international investments did really well in the first quarter, really well, as in they were up 10 or 11 or 12 percent, depending. That is an abnormal amount of return for a short period of time. So to me, that seemed like a pretty easy rebalance opportunity. We had a great quarter in one thing and everything else was kind of even Well, we just took a little profit off the table. The same thing could be said in the last year since then. Right. Internationals, if you have China investments, my gosh. This might be a great time from a rebalancing standpoint to be picking up some Asian allocations to your portfolio at what was 30 or 40% cheaper than it was just four or five months ago. Not to get too far in the weeds, but it sounds like what you're looking at. Well, and I think I can do this without getting in the weeds because I was going to talk about standard deviation. But really what we can do, I mean, what you're talking about is, hey, this is maybe in the top 5% of times where the market's gone up this quickly in that particular piece of your asset allocation. So because of that, that's why we're going to capture based on historically. I'm just, looking at the, I'm just looking at the allocation of what we have to the target. So if we want to have 20%. No, but in, what I'm saying is instead of using your date, you decided to do it early. But yeah, you, exactly. But, but you did it early because based on history, this upswing was way faster than anything you've seen historically, sure. except for a few times. Right. Yeah. Number three. Yeah. So my number three is more of a brainiac experience, I guess, than anything. First of all, you have to define what volatility really is. And I think that if you've dollar cost average, you've just done some rebalancing, spending time really recognizing what essentially is happening to the portfolio, to your investment account with volatility. And I'm using air quotes, you can't see, but putting the context of what it really is into what's happening, I think helps a ton. Volatility does not mean that you just lost money. Volatility means that today it's worth a different price than it was yesterday. But it's only worth that to those people that are selling today, not to you who are presumably not selling. Yeah, look beyond it to the, maybe the companies that you own if you own stocks or the real estate you own if it's a real estate thing or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's an interesting and a great way to look at it. My number three is setting stop losses. Much like number five where you set triggers in your head. I always liked stop losses better than triggers. Somebody came in, they're like, hey, if we go down 10%, I'm like, well, it's not what we should do. I'm saving what I think we should do for the number two and number one OG. But if I had a really nervous client, we would set a stop loss. Now we saw in August a problem with the guy in stop losses. Remember that guy, the financial advisor who set a stop loss at like negative 14 and the market one day went down, what, 30 or 40% the place where he was. 
it was a Vanguard share or something like that. It <laughs> cratered for one trade or something. And the bad news is even though he set the stop loss at 14, that doesn't mean that's what you get. The way a stop loss works is when your stop loss triggers your order to sell goes in with everybody else's order. So in a fast moving market, like with him, I think he lost 40% of his client's money. And then of course it came right back. And by the time he could buy it back, it was yeah, okay. Pretty, pretty big problem. Now, besides those frequent issues in a slow moving down market, like we had in 2000 to 2002, as an example, remember that it just seemed to go down a little bit every day, a stop loss Take your money out of the market. What I did like during that time frame anyway about stop loss was that once your money's out of the market, you're going to think a little more clearly about what you're going to do with it, how you're going to deploy it next than you will if you just have this, you know what, I'm below the trigger, but tomorrow it's going to turn around. It's funny how quickly people would abandon the tomorrow it's going to turn around approach when their stop loss hit. So for somebody really, really worried, my most nervous clients, stop losses mean you're not trusting me to watch it. You're not trusting you to watch it. You've got these automatic, nope, we're out. And you know what, we'll deal with the second half of that problem which is when do we rebuy, which is the bigger problem, as you know, G, but we'll deal with that one later. That's my number three. Number two. My number two looks suspiciously like it one you've had before. My number two is dollar cost averaging, because I think much more than the three more technical ways I talked about before, you know, leaving your money alone over long periods of time is probably a better thing to do and just adjusting how you buy, Right. And man, if I can up my dollar cost averaging in times when the market's going down, and really, Rick Edelman proved this in his book, The Truth About Money, you'll do well when you are buying when the market's going down. But you know when you do better? If you just do it consistently because you don't know, right? If you just keep the number consistent that you're putting in. But for people that were really nervous and I couldn't get them to turn off the financial pornography on CNBC or Fox Business, increasing dollar cost averaging during the downturn to at least get you excited about buying was my number two. I like even ratcheting it up. I mean, if you're saving $100 a month, do you think you can stretch and save 125 right now? Go, baby, go. You know? Absolutely. Just a little bit. Not going to miss 25 bucks, right? All right, number two for me. You're just staring at me like... <clears throat> Ta da! <laughs> You're on. It's you, dude. All right. So, my number two is kind of along with my third, which was to kind of define what volatility is to use history as a guide. You know, we talk about like the JP Morgan guide to the markets. There's lots of books that talk about stock market volatility. I'm not talking about trading books, I'm talking about history books or professional finance books. But if you use history as a guide, one of the things that you'll see is that the stock market has had a bear market, right? This We define it by a loss of 20%, 14 times since World War II. And what's happened And every time since then? Stock market's gone up every time after that. Now, it doesn't happen the next day. And it certainly feels like the worst thing imaginable while we're you know, kind of in the middle of it. But I think if you use history as a guide and say, okay, this time is not different. This is just some new apocalypse that's kind of sounds just like the old apocalypse that was 25 years ago, 35 years ago, 55 years ago. But every time that happened, came out of it stronger, the stock market went to an all time high, et cetera, et cetera. I think that helps with the emotional competence of, you know, watching the price changes in your portfolio. So use history. It's funny because, and I found that a lot with investors that older investors by and large, now it seemed like some of my most Nervous investors were older investors, but I think those are people that needed to play catch up, right? My clients, if I look back at my clients that were older and were nervous, were ones that didn't have enough money. But by and large, the older my clients were, the more downturns they'd seen, the more their emotional competence in getting through a downturn seemed to be. It always seemed to be the people that shouldn't worry about it, you know what I mean, that are in their 30s that were always the most worried well, it's probably because they didn't know how to react to it right. because it maybe may have been their first or second one, you know. Well, and that's on your point. I mean, my point is on your point. I think that's... Well, obviously it is. I think that's right on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Cha. And here we go. Are you ready? Number one. Oh, it's my turn again. You're looking at me again like... <clears throat> you set so up this, this thing where we go twice in a row, so... I know. All right. So my number one is you just have to be okay with it. There is nothing you can do about it. It's like one of those things, right? It is what it is. You can't fight the system. You can't fight the man. 
it's like gas prices, right? You can pound your fist and get upset that gas is two bucks a gallon or three bucks or five bucks or two fifty or whatever number it is that ticks you off. But unless you're willing to get on a bicycle and start riding around, you're a slave to whatever the price is, right? It is what it is. You just be okay with it. So volatility is one of those things. It is what it is. Stock market goes up, stock market goes down. Nobody complains about upside market volatility, right? Nobody complains that five or two or three years ago, the S&P was up 32%. Well, guess what? That is extreme volatility, but it's volatility to the upside. Everybody likes those days. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So you just have to be okay with it. And the best advice I think is just to turn off the TV you don't need to read the newspaper. You don't need to check on your statement every other minute or every other day or every other week. If you're 30 years from retirement, just keep on jamming money into your retirement plan. My goodness. What a great opportunity to buy stuff in buckets that you were paying twice as much for just a little while ago. I'm so tired of the phrase lately, the market keeps crashing. Yeah. Right. Come on. Define crash. I know. You mean it's at an all-time high, basically. (laughs) It's crazy. Love that, number one. My number one, it's so bad. But my number one and my number two are your number four and five. I think that's pretty funny because my number one is very close to your number one, but it also combines something you talked about before, which is plan out your needs. Because if you start with a needs-based approach and you know when you're going to need the dollar, you're going to pick investments that historically have done well over that time frame. The cool thing that does between now and then is gives you freedom from worry, right? So it's funny. I was answering a listener letter the other day, and we were talking about how long until they'd need the money. And what was cool was once we went through all of the pieces of the goal – we figured out that they would need the money after 10 years. And what was great about that, OG, was that that weeded out the vast majority of investments, right? Most of the investments that are out there, we didn't even have to worry about. We just looked for the seeds that we could plant today that historically have given us our return over that time frame. Do I need to worry about what the market does two years from now? Nope. Know what it does four years from now? Nope need to know what it does even six years from now. Nope. Because these are 10 year seeds that I'm planting. So once I start with my goal, I can just bury volatility. I could ignore the financial press. I can ignore the financial markets. And instead I can just focus on living my life full well, knowing that I'm going to make it there. So that's my number one. And by the way, rebalancing your portfolio is by the way, a piece of that. If you just leave it there, right? Your garden will get weeds. I mean, stuff is going to happen that makes the plane go different ways than you want it to. So when I talk about investments, historically, maybe it's, now let's use a baloney analogy, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, right? And it's that mix that got you there. It's that mix of seeds that got you there. So when you plant those, you want to make sure you stay on the 60-40. Yeah. And I think the one thing that I missed that you kind of hinted on, I don't know that you did it on purpose, was starting with the plan. And when you define what the plan is and you define what sort of rate of return you need to reach your goals, within that also defines the ups and downs swings that you might experience. If we sat down and did a financial plan and your financial plan, Joe, said that you needed 3% a year return to reach your long-term financial goals. Well, the investments that we would put in a plan that needs a 3% annual return to reach your goals don't have 20% price swings, right. generally speaking. Right? They're like treasury bonds or low volatility things. The opposite is also true. If you need to get a 9% rate of return for your goals, and you've decided that that's the most important thing is to reach your goals, well, to get 9%, you have to be okay with the plus 30s and the minus 30s. For me, it's really cool because it's so hands-off right? I mean, it's the sure way to get there and it's hands off. That's what to me is exciting about it. I mean, if you want to sit and watch the financial news all day and worry about it all day, okay, fine, go ahead and do that. But does anybody really want to do that? I don't want anything to do with that. So great stuff, man. Love that top five. Hey, trivia fans, here's a question for you. Joe mentioned options in his top five, which gives us the opportunity to ask, Which type of option do you set to guarantee against a stock price falling? I'll be back with the answer after I go ask Joe which one's correct. We 
We know there's all those things that you put off. You know that you should do them, but you put them off. I think about that right now because as we buy this house, I'm thinking I'm not putting it off this time when it comes to this house and the things that I really want to do for me because I'm tired of getting houses ready for the new person who lives there instead of for me. For me, well, another thing I've always wanted is straighter teeth and a better smile. Well, I'm done putting that off too. And thanks to Candid, straightening my teeth is simpler, easier, and more comfortable than ever. Candid clear liners are comfortable, removable, practically invisible, unlike wire braces. So you can transform your smile without anybody noticing. Plus, your treatment's prescribed and monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. It's all done from the comfort and convenience of your own home. Candid only works with orthodontists, never a general dentist like some other companies. Plus, your supervising orthodontist, that's the same orthodontist who's going to be with you every step of the way. With Candid, your treatment includes remote monitoring by the same orthodontist who created your plan. You're never going to have to worry how you're doing. You'll always know, and I love that. The average candid treatment is about six months and you'll start seeing results way before then. And it costs thousands of dollars less than braces. Start straightening your teeth today. Right now, all stackers can save 75 bucks on candid starter kit. Go to candidco.com slash SB and use code SB. That's candidco.com slash SB, code SB. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Save $75 stackers on your starter kit candidco.com slash sb code sb if you're a business owner you don't need og and i to tell you that running a business is tough but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary don't let quickbooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore time to upgrade to netsuite stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software that you've outgrown now is the time to upgrade to netsuite by oracle the world's number one cloud business system netsuite gives you visibility and control over your financials hr inventory e-commerce and more everything you need all in one place instantaneously so whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue save time and money with NetSuite you can join over 21,000 companies using NetSuite right now let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash stacker Schedule your free product trial right now at netsuite.com slash stacker, netsuite.com slash stacker. Hey, trivia fans, here was today's trivia question. Which type of option do you set to guarantee against a stock price falling? The answer, while there are many strategies to protect a portfolio, the most straightforward is to buy what's called a put option. A put is the right to sell your stock at a prearranged price. You buy the option priced at the current level of the stock. Then if the price drops, you'll be able to sell your stock at the option price rather than at the current lower price. If the stock price rises, you only paid the price of the option. Options are offered through most brokers, but you'll have to apply to use them. So make sure you have clearance and a firm grasp of how they work before trying this strategy. Me? I'll stick with the old buy and hold. See ya! We get letters, OG. Letters have been coming in fast and furious lately, which makes me so excited. I love talking to the people that listen to the show. To send us a letter, send those to Joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Or first on the Quartacy Hotline today, well, we're going to do one, and that comes from Sam. Hello, Joe and OG. I enjoy your show very, very much. It makes my commuting to work much easier and more fun and educational of a drive. My question for you is about stretched IRA. Can you please instruct us on how to properly set up a stretched IRA? I know you could do this with a rollover or a Roth or even old 401ks, but how do we properly establish a stretched IRA? Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks for the question, Sam. Sam's getting in the weeds with us, OG. Stretch IRA is a little bit technical, but let's talk first about what a stretch IRA is. Yes. So stretch IRA is used colloquially. It's not an actual term in the IRS code. It's basically the concept of allowing your IRA to have a different payout period for your beneficiaries. 
up until 2006, you really had two choices if you inherited an IRA. You had option one, which was take the money out. And if you take the money out of an IRA, you get taxed on it. Now, since the person who originally put the money in is dead, there's no penalty. But if you inherited grandma's IRA of 100000 and you took the money out, that 100000 gets added to your taxable income that year. You pay income taxes, so on and so forth. The other option, the second option prior to 2006 was to do a five-year payout which meant that you could take anything you wanted out over the first five years, but at the end of the fifth year, all of it had to be out. And that was about the extent of it. Those were your two options. If you didn't take it all out in the first year, it was determined that you meant to make it a five-year payout. And you would just, you know, at the end of the fifth year is when it would all come due. The benefit to that, of course, is if you didn't need the money, you could defer it. And deferring tax-deferred money is good because it continues to grow tax-deferred. Of course, the problem is that at the end of the fifth year, now you inherited grandma's 100000 now it's worth 120000 You still have to take it all out at that point in time. But the five-year plan at least allowed you to kind of piecemeal it if you wanted to do it right. that way. In 2006, the Pension Protection Act added another distribution plan. And I'm talking about, again, I should just put an asterisk here. This is going to be for somebody who's not a spouse, right? So if you're a spouse, you got your whole... You can roll it over in years of, or... Yeah, you got a whole different way to do it. But if you inherit grandma's IRA or something. Now, starting in 2006, which I believe that's 10 years ago already. Oh, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day too. It's 2016. It's 16 years since 2000. What in the heck? I remember in the 1980s thinking about where I would be because I graduated from high school in 1986 and thinking, Holy Carl, really? And thinking, where would I'm I be in 2016? Where would I be? Yeah. Did old, you graduate when you were like 11 or something? Old, I, I, I did. Yeah, I got that boyish look. Right. In what year? 1986? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Oh, you are way older than me. <laughs> Let's keep moving, dude. Anyway, so in 2006, Pension Protection Act started what's called beneficial IRAs. So now when you inherit someone's IRA, you can take the distribution over your lifetime. And now big, gigantic asterisk, talk to a tax professional. Yeah, right. Not tax people. Talk to your own financial and tax advisors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But the main point of it is this. Now, if you inherit grandma's IRA of $100,000, you don't have to take it out next year. You don't even have to take it over five years. You can take it over your lifetime. The IRS has a table that tells you the distribution plan based on how old you are the year that you inherit the money. So if you're 30, you just look up at the tables, 30, and it tells you how many years you get to take it out over. And it's basically your life expectancy at the age you are when you inherit it. So if you are 30 years old, maybe your life expectancy is 80 years. So now you get to take it out over the next 50 years, which is to say that next year, grandma's $100,000 IRA, you take out 1 50th of it. Okay. The next year, you take out 1 49th of it and 1 48th of it and so on and so forth until you distribute the whole thing. Again, the benefit is, is that you're now, and this is where it came in the vernacular, you're stretching the IRA. Are there any forms that somebody like Sam, if they're a beneficiary, would have to fill out? or do Absolutely you just... nothing that you have to do until the owner of the IRA dies. And again, if you leave it to your spouse, then your spouse has a whole different way whole different. to do it. Yeah. But if you're leaving your IRA to someone who's a non-spouse beneficiary, whether it's your children or cousins or a trust or something like that, then you can use this new stretch provision, which allows you to, well, allows the beneficiary anyway, to distribute it over their lifetime. But at that time, are there forms that need to be filled out to say that you're, to clarify that you're stretching nope. the, no. Nope. Nothing to do. Yep. You have to follow the rules as to when you take your first distribution, and which is, um, which is, part. it's the year after the person dies. So if someone, if you inherit an IRA in 2016, you have to take your first distribution by December of 2017. And then at least annually thereafter, if you don't do it annually, then it's determined that you actually meant to do the five-year plan. So just like the other one had a default of if you don't do anything, you meant the five-year plan. This one is if you don't do anything, you mean the five-year plan also. So the best advice when it comes to the IRA is if you inherit an IRA, you have to talk to a tax person who knows about this. You have to talk to a financial advisor. Thanks for the question from Sam. Got time for one more here. Question from Vinny. Vinny has the most asked question here on the Stacking Benjamin Show. Love the show. It's the best personal finance show out there. Thanks, Vinny. Vinny currently works in corporate America sales and has used that job to build a small nest egg, but his passion is in growing wealth through investments. Ours too. <laughs> Vinny'd like to pursue a career in this industry and recently put in a few applications. He got some responses, but when he looked into the firms, they were selling shock of shocks, OG, high cost options and seemed like inferior options to what he would tell a friend to buy. 
what do we think the best way is to change careers to the investment industry? He has low expenses and could afford to take a pay cut in the short term, but would like to have long-term opportunity to earn a good living. He's 34 years old and has a strong financial house. Thanks for the input, Vinny. Thanks, Vinny, for the question. OG? Yeah, you handle this probably better than I do. But the reality is, is that being a financial advisor is the trail of tears. I mean, it is a really rough, (laughs) rough go of it, especially if you don't do anything that gives you immediate compensation. So if you shy away from the sales organizations, right, the companies that have sales quotas and pay you a big fat commission every time you do something, it's going to take a while. I mean, you think about it this way. If your average client pays you 1%, let's say, and you want a personal income of $100,000, that means that you have to manage $10 million in order to get $100,000 in fees, right? Well, but 100000 in fees is not your income. You still have business expenses and staff and overhead and compliance and technology and custodial fees and travel and you're a business owner. So you got all the business owner expenses. You got to buy copy paper and all this other sort of jazz. So really the best run financial houses in the financial planning industry run at about a 50% margin, right? I guess there's probably some out there that do 60, but I don't know that they exist very well. 50%, right? If you can keep 50% of your revenue to overhead and keep 50% to the owner, so be it. So now that means you have to manage $20 million because then you generate $200,000 in fees, you spend $100,000 on overhead and you keep 100000 So the key is how long can you afford to wait to grow your income to that level and also, you know, what's the plan to get that $20 million under management? You know, the biggest thing about our business I think people forget is, and this is what he said here, is, hey, I'm a great finance guy. I'm really smart when it comes to money. People will, of course, hire me. It, that is not true. You can be the smartest guy in the world and people won't hire you. There was always a joke in our office that there was the guy in the back room who's smarter than anybody else, knew the answer to every question. And it was actually one of our top people who said, One day, one of the admins accidentally had the paychecks sitting on the copier, had forgotten, right? And the smartest dude by far had one of the smallest paychecks of anybody. The hustler guy that didn't know crap, but knew how to go to the back room and ask the smart guy for answers. That was the guy that was getting paid. So the point being... Our job is sales and marketing, despite the fact that we don't want it to be. It's sales and marketing 100%. Yeah, especially at the beginning, especially at the beginning. I mean, you accumulate knowledge and my goal was always to know as much as possible, as quickly as possible, but that didn't mean I didn't have to hustle. I had to have meetings with 10 potential new clients every week. Multiply that by 52 weeks a year for the first couple of years. And there's no such thing as vacation. Yeah. My first manager, I think, was one of the reasons that I started off so successfully, which was and had a pretty long career. And that was that he told my wife, he didn't tell me, he told my wife, kiss your husband goodbye for two years, because that's what this is going to be. And by the way, there are managers who don't do that. And I know at our firm, the one that I worked at, we had managers sometimes, I would deal with brand new advisors that would be coping with the fact that the manager told them a bill of goods. Yeah, you're not going to work Saturdays, you're going to work nine to five you know what? If you're doing it right, you're not working on it. You can't afford to not work 95. That whole Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours is huge. Now, what type of firm should he go into? If he's really worried about cost structure, he might be able to find, look for independent advisors that will pay him a salary to be somebody in the back room, not on the sales end. You're not going to make much money, but you're going to learn how the business works without that sales and marketing thing that you'll get in a lot of the big firms, you know, that wash out a lot of people. Yeah, I know that Michael Keitze's firm, the XY Planning Network, yeah. they always have a lot of new advisor recruiting stuff on their end. So that might be a good place to start if you're looking for a fee-only firm or a fee firm that is hiring new advisors. I would agree that's probably the best way to start because being smart about money is different than being a smart business owner who handles other people's money. Yeah. Those are two different things. And that is the trick. It was funny. I remember one guy, my first year coping with the fact he goes, I didn't realize I'd be on the phone all day talking to strangers. I thought that we'd be actually financial advising. And I remember my manager going, really, you're the brand new guy right out of college. And you thought we were going to give you all the big clients. Is that what you thought? That the brand new dude who has no clue what's going on was going to get the million dollar accounts. You actually thought that. Welcome to reality, pal. So, yeah, big stuff. 
glad for it's the enormously qu- satisfying, but it's a slow boat to China, that's for sure. But I do remember the switch, don't you? I do remember the switch when all of a sudden it became a job where I could take time off. I could be a lifestyle entrepreneur if I wanted to, or I could keep growing. I could decide if I took a lot of vacations or if I put the pedal to metal, but that was my decision. As long as I was taking care of my clients and I had a good team around me, then that was great. So uh, thanks for the question, Vinny. If you've got a question for the show, you can either leave us a message on the Courtesy Hotline, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, or write me a note, joe at stackingbenjamins.com. That's going to do it, man. Tons of fun. Well, for you, anyway. Because <laughs> I get to sit with you. Well, obviously. That's a major reason to it. <laughs> dream. Hashtag dream. <laughs> <laughs> the lessons from today's show. Biggest lessons from today's show. Can't control volatility. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Put a plan in place and work from there. I love how your number one and my number one were very similar. If you set up your plan, the volatility kind of takes care of itself when it comes to you reaching your goals. Good stuff. I don't think we got to do more than that. Hey, on Wednesday's show, Glenn Carter coming down to the basement. Listen to this, OG, making money from the sharing economy. You know, all these statistics that showed that the younger somebody is, the more they appreciate the sharing economy. People even question, do I need a car anymore, right? Do I need a car? Do I need, do I need, I no longer need, <laughs> remember when you and I were kids, you know, needed stuff that was physical music. Now you just stream that stuff, right? And now how much stuff do I really need to accumulate? Glenn Carter coming down to the basement on Wednesday to talk about that. It's going to be interesting. How do you make money off that economy? I think that'll be a great conversation. We'll see everybody on Wednesday. Stack more Benjamins. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC, copyright 2016. It's created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Brent Selmans, and edited by Isabella Bianca. Special thanks to Joe and OG for sharing their ways to manage risk in a portfolio. I'm currently working on my number one way, which is to create as much gold as possible to line my utility or spacious spare bedroom I'm going to rent out. So far, though, these gold recipes don't seem to be working. Maybe I need to order a better magic crystal set. Got to read you this, man. This comes from Cosmopolitan because you know what a big reader of Cosmopolitan I am. This is a letter that a dad wrote when his six-year-old asked him for money. He took the old ING logo, you know, that lion, the orange lion. Right. And in the blue letters where it said ING, he replaced that with DAD and it's dad savings alone. And it says, you know how companies have a tagline? Dad's tagline is because apparently I look like I made of money. <laughs> and it's trifolded and everything. And it's a brochure. Oh, it's just a letter to his son. Oh, okay. Very professionally. It says, Dad, CEO, Dad, SNL, St. Louis, Missouri. Dear kid, we regret to inform you at this time we're unable to provide a loan in the amount requested of $20. After reviewing your account, we have found you have insufficient funds and a history of not doing your chores. Furthermore, over $80 has been spent on discretionary expenses since Christmas. This is an unsustainable amount of expenditure, and we cannot further compound the problem by financially assisting with recurring further debt at this point. If you'd like to refute this decision, 
you can contact our complaint department at air code 314 blacked out. Our dispute manager at this number may be able to persuade us to reverse our decision. Thank you for choosing Dad Savings and Loan. We appreciate the chance to serve your financial needs. Sincerely, Dad. Love it. That's pretty hardcore when you're sending your kid the <laughs> complaint letter. Sounds like a letter that I get all the time. From your wife? No. Dear OG. She, she doesn't take the time to write a letter. <laughs> she just says no. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, that's funny, but why not get kids to learn early? Now we had our college savings week on last week. I think I've talked before about the guy I worked with that gave his kids allowances and then withheld taxes. I'm going to do that. Just great. Or the dad. Withhold taxes. Yeah. There was also the dad mom that I worked with that told their kids early on. And I like it as long as you do this right. I don't like families that say we're not paying for X amount of college. And then they do nothing to help their kids. I mean, Brad Baldridge talked about that last week, right? About how parents will say, nope, you're going to have to get loans and stuff. Good luck with that. And they don't help out at all. Your kid doesn't have the readiness to get through that. Be a parent, give them the readiness. But I had this couple that said, we are not paying for your first semester of school. We have instead a reimbursement program. You figure out how to pay the first semester. And then if you get an A or B at the end of your first semester, we will reimburse you, not just the tuition credits, but also room and board for the second semester which is enough to pay for the second semester. So if you get all A's and B's, you know, say you got four classes, we will do all of it. If you get three A's and B's, we'll reimburse 75%. You're going to have to figure out the other quarter. And basically Tim and Sue, their feeling was, Tim said it best. I don't want my kid being the one pumping the keg going, my dad's paying for this. Yeah. Oh, we had a friend in college, my wife and I, who her parents said they're not going to pay for anything at all. So she ended up getting student loans, but she would like check the boxes to like maximum available and would get $25,000 of student loans for one semester or whatever the number was. Oh, and then numbers. would just spend it. And just blow it off. Oh. Yeah. yeah. But some of that's parenting. A lot of that's parenting. I had a friend in college who was given a credit card by her parents and she would run it up. And then so what, did she make it till like September 11th? <laughs> you know, like. This thing isn't working. Dad, my credit card's not working. It's like, I give you a $1,200 limit. Of course not. No, no, no. Oh, man, it was worse than that. She actually made it to her junior year before she was in big trouble. I don't even know how the story ends. But Lisa had this credit card from her parents and she ran it up. And she couldn't tell them she ran up because she ran up on stupid stuff. But she went to, you know how at the student union, they always have that table with, hey, get yourself into credit card debt, right? Yeah, free t-shirt. So she take out that card and she would do a balance transfer. And then she would... Now she has two cards. She had people give her, I think, seven cards before she finally got, like the whole paying this credit card with that credit card, the Ponzi scheme, finally came crashing down. And I don't know how it ended. I do remember like a day before she was going to finally call her dad and admit to her dad that she'd run up, I don't remember how many thousands and thousands of dollars of credit card debt and hadn't told him. Yeah. Well, that's also a little parenting, I think, don't you think? I mean, your kids are in college. You've taught them good money behavior. I'm sure they blow money on stupid stuff that you wouldn't recommend, but they also understand the consequences of that. So yeah. fun times. I'm going to do the taxes thing and okay. insurance and like retirement plan. I'm going to like have all that, you know, like here's your $5 minus taxes, minus, you know, this, minus that, minus that, minus that. Here's your dollar seventy five. What? I thought I got $5. Well, you did, except for... I got to figure out what's okay to pay my kids so I can do some Roth IRAs for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. People have lots of opinions on that. And my opinion was always, I would rather trust my kid with a little too much money when they're young than with not any and have what happened to me. My story, which we won't get into today, where you go to college and you haven't handled a dollar your entire life and then all of a sudden you're free. So I would rather have kids make big mistakes with 10 bucks. So what a lot of parents say And people freak out when you say this, but give them their age a week. And then people say, what's my kid need with that kind of money? They don't. But there's other things that I like that came with that territory. You give them their age, but then they have to buy their own stuff. So when you take the family to a movie, let's say, depending on how much they get, they get enough to actually handle the concession stand. (laughs) I was going to say, yeah, nine bucks for my oldest. He he wouldn't have enough money. Right. He'd have to save six months to go to one movie. 
but they have to pay at least a portion of their own. So they have to make some decisions with their money. You know what I mean? You're not just giving them the money and buying them everything. You're deciding stuff that is fun that they have to do to pay for themselves. You got to cut back what you give them and have them make those critical decisions. We did that with my kids. My daughter kept touching that stove for maybe five months before she realized, you know what, I can keep wasting my allowance and just building up this crap or I can actually save it. You gave my son an allowance. You never saw that money again. I mean, that money was buried somewhere. I've got like that too. One is a saver and one is a spender. How do two kids born of the same parents become so opposite that way? I don't get it. Well, I mean, my wife and I are complete opposites too. I'll let you figure out who's who. Yeah, we know who's the spender, dude. We already know. All right. See everybody next time. Peace.